Hello everyone, welcome to our to part one of our discussion of corporate taxation. This is chapter 15, the last chapter in your textbook that we're going to cover. Uh, so we're going to talk about how a corporation uh, is formed and taxed. And so that uh, as we wrap up our discussion this semester. So I'll get right into it. First of all, let's talk about forming a corporation. These have to be formed uh, as a legal entity in the state that you are operating. And the, how that's done is it depends on the state. In Pennsylvania, it's quite simple. Uh, but it, the process does require paperwork and the payment of a fee. It cannot just be by chance be a corporation. It has to be uh, done this way. You have to go through the paperwork. Otherwise, you are not a corporation. Um, and so while it is not an onerous situation, it is a, uh, a necessary one. So when you form it, you're going to decide a couple of things. First of all, you're going to decide the, the, the time period in which you are going to report your income as a corporation. So they can choose uh, a fiscal year. They can choose in their first year, they can kind of, they got some choices. They can do a short year in that they could do it, if they started on June 1st, they could do it from June 1st to the end of the year, December 31st, call it a short tax year the first year, or they could do a fiscal year and go ahead and go a whole 12 months until the next year. Fiscal year is any year that doesn't end um, uh, on December 31st. Typically though, you still have to end on the end of a month. However, there are a couple of exceptions to that, but You've got to be, it's got, it's got to be the same every year. So that's what you're, you're up against. There's really not much benefit tax-wise to uh, choosing a fiscal year. However, sometimes you want to not be uh, completing all your tax reports and things at the end of the year. If that's a busy time, if the end of the calendar year is a busy time, maybe a fiscal year makes more sense. Uh, for File a Form 1120, except for S corporations, we'll talk about later, File 1120S, uh, that looks a lot more like the partnership return than it does the, the regular 10, 1120. Uh, notice that uh, tax returns are don't do a fourth month, 15th day. So for a calendar year, that's April 15th. That's the same date as uh, individuals file and a six month extension is allowed for corporations just like it is for individuals. That's different than for uh, a partnership, just as from last chapter. There's a kind of a weird rule that if you use June 30th, you have only till the third month instead of the fourth month, but then you get a seven month extension to make up for it. So uh, I'm not sure who, what quirk whose quirk that was to put that in, but that's that's the way that one works. So if you're going to form a co corporation, typically the those that incorporate it or uh, the incorporators contribute money or other assets to the corporation in exchange for stock. So they put in money, cash, other things, and get back a... a ownership in the form of stock. So we, we want it to basically work so that you can form a corporation without a taxable event. However, it does require a little bit more work than with a partnership. Partnerships, it doesn't matter what the situation, how much the partners own after, the, after they contribute to the partnership. But in corporation, if you want it to be truly um, tax-free, then immediately after the transfer, the transfers control 80% or more. So that's not a requirement for a partnership, but it is for a corporation. You must put, you know, must be only the people that are going to control the corporation after the fact. So if you come along later or at another time and you put money into, an uh, asset into the corporation, it still may be tax-free, but there's a possibility that if you contribute assets that are appreciated, meaning that they are worth more than the, your basis, 
you could have a, uh, a gain on that. Okay? So that's the first thing is you're, you're going to contribute uh, to the partnership, to the corporation. And basically, your, you're gonna, your basis in whatever assets you contribute is going to be your basis in your new shares of stock. So if you have when it's cash, it's easy. So if you contribute $30,000, that's your basis in your stock that you are going to own in return. It gets a little more complicated if there is property contributed as well, especially if it has the property has a value or is worth more than what your basis is. So in those cases, um, you're going to transfer the basis over and you're not going to recognize that gain by, for receiving the stock. Except in two cases where the shareholder contributes an asset subject to a liability. So let's say that you have an asset that is, uh, has a basis of 100000 and it has a loan uh, against it that is more than 100,000. If you, by contributing to the corporation, you get relieved of that loan, meaning you give the assets and the liability to the corporation and get in return stock. So if you get back, the, the re relief of the loan is more than what your basis is, then you're gonna have a gain equal to that excess. And if you get cash back, okay, that could also generate a gain. All right, so any type of boot you receive. So the, the caveat, you, if you just get stock back and there's no assumption of liabilities, there's no way there'll be a gain or loss as long as you uh, own 80% after the fact, after the contribution. So the basis of the contributed property of the corporation is whatever it was in the hands of the shareholder, plus any gain recognized under those two cases we just talked about. So the general scenario is, okay, I have land. It cost me 50000 It's now worth 100000 I contribute it to the corporation. The corporation is now going to take that $50,000 basis that I had in the land. That's going to be the land. The, corporation basis. My basis in my stock is going to be the 50000 It's all based on the basis that we had in the land before we give that. So that's referred to what the corporation is going to use, and that becomes important for, for depreciation, things like that, not for land because land isn't appreciated, but other assets. We need to know what that basis is to the corporation to calculate depreciation. Basis to the stock of the stock of the stockholder is important because that's what's going to determine if we sell that stock to someone else what our gain or loss is going to be. So it needs to be the basis of the property contributed plus any gain recognized minus any boot received, and that boot includes the taking over your loan. All right, so you have to subtract out any cash received back from the corporation or uh, other boot, including the, the debt relief. Typically, that outside basis, once established at the beginning, does not change. It, it doesn't flow through and change on a constant basis like with we experience on a partnership where it is going up or down based on the net, the income of the partnership. That's not happening in a corporation in this C corporation scenario, and that's what we're talking about. A C corporation it is a separate le legal entity, has its own taxes, uh, and therefore your what you paid for it or what you contributed at the beginning stays your basis through through the process of um, owning that stock. An example: Arturo contributed land with a forward value of one hundred thousand, basis of forty thousand to a newly formed corporation in exchange for ninety percent. Meets the 80% criteria, right? So even though he's getting a $100,000 worth of stock, because that's what his land was worth, 
His base is only, and his base is only forty thousand. You've got a realized gain of sixty thousand, but that's not recognized. Instead, the forty thousand dollars becomes the basis to the land inside the corporation, and it becomes the basis for Arturo's stock going forward. If there had been a loan of ten thousand against that land that was assumed by the corporation. That ten thousand dollars assumption would reduce his basis down to thirty thousand. And if the loan had been fifty thousand, and they had the corporation, he would have had gain because it, the corporation would have actually assumed more debt than his basis. Okay. When when this slide says that we determine taxable income generally. The same way as a trade or business, like you learn in chapter six, meaning when when the IRS and the courts have decided an expense is an expense and whether it's necessary and and uh, reasonable and all that kind of stuff, uh, they, they have usually they usually is not based on what the entity is. So it, whatever rulings would apply to an S corp, C corp partnership, sole proprietorship doesn't all the same. There's no such thing as AGI like an individual. There's not that, uh, you might say, intermediate step uh, that determines the deductions on, on other items like there is in a personal taxes. Some other differences between individual taxation on individuals that we've gotten used to and that for corporations. Uh, Capital gains and losses are really not existent in a corporation. We can't take net capital loss. Remember that there's limited for individuals to three thousand dollars or or fifteen hundred. Uh, but for corporations, it's not any. All you can do is use your capital loss to offset capital gains. If you don't have capital gains in the current year, you can go back three years and forward five years, but that's the limit. And in those new years, it's not like you get to take the loss. You just get to offset it against capital gains in those new years. So that's all it can do, no matter whether how far where you carry it back or forward to. Then net capital gains do not get special tax treatment, meaning the tax rate is the same on capital gains as it is on any other ordinary income. So there's really no differentiation between capital gains and ordinary income for corporations. Now, you remember there was donations uh, were limited by AGI under individual tax rules. It's even more limited under for corporations. They're limited only 10% of their uh, taxable income. Uh, and you, you look at that before you consider the charitable contributions, before the dividends received deductions, before carrybacks. 10% uh, of that is all you can give away to charity. Uh, and receive a charitable contribution. If you do more than that, you have to carry it forward. Can't go back on this one, just forward five years, which is the same time period as individuals if they can't deduct their charitable contributions. All right, now, uh, for ordinary income property, this often corporations, especially large corporations, donate inventory. That is ordinary income property. That is limited to its cost. You cannot donate that and then count the donation at fair market value or what you would sell it for. Rather, it's what it costs. And obviously, that's a big difference for uh, inventory in many cases. Okay, the other oddball deduction is what's called dividends received deductions. This is when one corporation owns stock in another corporation. That other corporation pays the first corporation dividends what th this essentially does is allow you a deduction for part of, at least, your dividends received. Therefore, only part of it would actually be included in income. So if you, if you have 20% or more of the stock, you get a 50% deduction, which means you, you only end up including in your taxable income 50% of the dividends you receive. Okay. 65% if it's anywhere between 20% and 80% of the stock in another company. That means you end up only being able to 
you actually only include 35%. And then finally, if you own over 80% of a stock in another company and they pay you dividends, uh, you don't have you get a dividend received deduction of 100% of the dividends you receive. Now, how this works is on the return, you report the dividends received as income, and then you take a deduction for the percentage. So you see the result is the difference. So if you're if you report 100% of the dividends and you get a deduction for 65%, that's the same as including 35%. But that's not how you do it. You Include 100% and then do a deduction for 65%. That's how the form is set up to calculate. And that may be limited by the amount of your income uh, in certain cases.